Let me add my aloha and welcome to all of you gathered here at the 60th National Prayer Breakfast. Let us pray. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. We come to you to pray for our world leaders. Give them your wisdom to deal with the challenging problems of our time. May your spirit rest upon them as they seek to empower people to lead quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and honesty. Send out your light and lead our world leaders with your truth. Bring them through strife and warfare to lasting peace uniting them for the glory of your name. As they put aside selfish ambition, make them instruments of your will to carry out your purposes in our world. We pray this in your sovereign name. Amen. Amen. Well done. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. When we take the long view of history, it's pretty clear that ideas are more powerful than money or guns or even governments. So if we follow that logic, ideas about God would be the most powerful of all. One of the most precious resources of the community of faith are those women and men who help us think deeply and clearly about God, about truth, and about responsibility. Eric Metaxas has been a friend of this breakfast for many years. So let that be a warning to all of you. If you come too often, we may ask you to speak. <laughs> but he has written two uh, New York Times bestsellers, 30 children's books, has been part of the Veggie Tale series. He's also debated the existence of God in academic settings all over the world. I first became aware of him from his book, Amazing Grace, about William Wilberforce, whose life will, makes a great guidebook for anyone who's serving in government. I just finished another book of his uh, about another great public role model, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, pastor, martyr, prophet, spy. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Metaxas. Well, good morning to all of you, honored guests uh, from around the world, from this great nation, mostly um, to our president and first lady. What an honor to be here. Now, I have to ask, uh, <clears throat> I want to know how many people are here this morning. If you don't mind, just indulge me. Would you raise your hand if you're here, and I just want to get a quick... <laughs> okay, that was four. All right. Well, they said 4,000. Um, <clears throat> let me just say up front, uh, I'm not a morning person. Um, but it is nonetheless an honor to speak at this august, extraordinarily early uh, gathering. Um, now, I, I know it's an august gathering because they charged $175 for breakfast. I, I don't want to start out by being negative, but I, I think there may be some kind of uh, money laundering thing kind of <laughs> happening here. I, I, I'm speaking truth to power, people. The price gouging, it needs to stop. Even as a member of the elite 1%, I cannot afford this. <laughs> but you know, we, we joke. Yeah. We joke, we joke, but, um, thank you. We joke, but uh, seriously, I, I know who puts these events on. They are a highly secret, indeed a nefarious organization. <laughs> they call themselves the family, yes. The family, yes. The family. You see, the family not only runs this event, they run everything that's happening 
In the world, we, and of course I mean the President and I most specifically, are all their puppets. <clears throat> The, the, the president knows what I mean. He cannot admit this publicly, obviously. But appearing here this morning, we're, we're simply doing their bidding. Um, every U.S. president has been elected by them, except for Warren G. Harding. No one knows how uh, Warren Harding was able to buck that trend, but we know that he paid dearly for it, most notably by being saddled with the name Warren G. Harding. <laughs> Uh, quick word on the dais thing up here. I'm not a politician, so when I see a dais like this, I immediately think of those wonderful Dean Martin roasts from the 70s. That was my, my favorite show next to Sanford and Son. I'm being honest with you now. And, and forgive me if, if I pretend uh, that I'm up here with Ruth, Ruth Buzzy, Bob Hope, Jimmy Stewart, uh, Red Buttons, Charlie Callis, Foster Brooks, and Rich Little. That's, I'm being honest, that's who I wish were up here. Uh, and to those of you who are actually up here, uh, I, I apologize from the bottom of Don Rickles' heart. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, it's National Prayer Breakfast. Maybe we should get serious and say something about prayer. Nah. Uh, okay, seriously though, what is prayer? The real question is, wh what is, what is prayer? Prayer is real faith in God. It is not phony religiosity. It is not, oh, wouldst thou, O oh, sovereign, of the universe take this archaic verbiage as evidence that we believe that thou art an old-fashioned and unpleasant and easily annoyed and even cranky deity and that to get thy magnificent attention and so as not to annoy thee we must needs employ wooden and archaic and religious sounding language that my friends is not prayer that uh, is to use the current terminology a lot of pious baloney who, who said that I, I believe it was Nancy Pelosi it was some it was someone on the couch, I can't remember. Um, but the point is, pious baloney is not prayer, it's not faith in the God of Scripture. Uh, imagine talking to Jesus that way. He'd almost laugh at you. Imagine if we talked to him that way. Prayers from the heart, we don't try to fool God with phony religiosity. Adam and Eve tried that with a fig leaf once, did not go so well. Um, and this gets at my theme this morning, the theme, uh, difference between religion or religiosity and real faith in God. We all know people who go to church who do not show the love of Jesus. We know people who know scriptures but who sometimes use it as a weapon. Real prayer and real faith is not religious. It is from the heart. It's honest. It's real. I've had the privilege of writing about two men, Wilberforce and Bonhoeffer, whose lives illustrate the difference between what mere religiosity and actually knowing and serving God is. Let me first quickly tell you personally how I came to see the difference between these two utterly different things. Okay, first of all, I'm the son of European immigrants who met in an English class in New York City in 1956, and I thank the Lord that my parents are in the room this morning. Don't, please don't get up. My, uh, my dad is Greek, hence my surname Metaxas. My mom is German, hence my deep love for Siegfried and Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when you raise Greek, uh, when, when you have one Greek parent, you're, you're raised Greek. Forget about the German stuff, okay? Greeks, <laughs> Greeks believe that being Greek is the most important thing in the world. Now, I'm 50% I'm Greek, but I've always tried to be more than 50% Greek, but I've never been able to, to break the 50% <laughs> barrier a, a little bit like Brother Mitt. Um, I, I, I thought you might like that. Good. Um, I grew up, of course, in the Greek Orthodox Church. I was an altar boy. Um, had a modicum of faith, mostly nominal cultural uh, faith. I uh, thought of myself as, as a Christian. But then I went to Yale University. Of course, it's the dream come true for every son of working class European uh, immigrants. But the reality is that Yale and most of our universities, but especially Yale, is a very secular place, aggressively secular. What little modicum of faith I had was seriously challenged. Uh, the idea of God really uh, is ignored or even sneered at. By the time I graduated, I was quite sure um, that it was wrong to be serious about the Bible or to take Jesus seriously, that it was hopelessly parochial and divisive. I wasn't sure what was supposed to replace it, but uh, I was confused. I, I guess I was lost. I wanted to be a writer. I was not terribly successful. I floundered, then I drifted, <clears throat> then, I, then I floundered some more, and then I drifted and floundered together, uh, which you think is easy. Uh, eventually things got so bad I moved back in with my parents, which I do not recommend. I specifically... <laughs> 
I specifically don't recommend moving in with my parents. Um, I joke, I joke, but it was, a, it was in fact a very tough time for me. I, uh, I I'm, I'm being serious now. Uh, I suffered... Uh, I suffered then, during that period, from real, uh, you know, genuine depression. I still uh, struggle with that. This was a really painful, soul-searching uh, time in my life. Very, very painful. Um, I took a really depressing job, which my parents forced me to take. Thank you very much. Uh, and while I was at this job, this miserable job, thank you, Mom and Dad. Um, thank you. You want to? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I met a man of some faith, and he begins to share his faith with me, the secular Yale uh, agnostic, um, and uh, I was in enough pain that I was willing to listen a little bit to what he had to say. He was an Episcopalian, I figured it's safe, they don't really believe that stuff anyway, so, you know, what do you, <laughs> hey, please, please. And um, so I said, yeah, you, you can keep talking, but he turned out to be one of those Episcopalians who actually believed this stuff and uh, knew the Bible backwards and forwards, and I was really challenged, we would have a lot of conversations. Um, I was not ready to accept what he was saying, not ready to pray or have a Bible study or go to church or become a weird, born-again Christian like many of you. Um, <laughs> not ready, but I was in enough pain to keep listening. Uh, this friend of mine said to me that, you know, I should pray that God would reveal himself to me, which seemed absurd because I thought, I don't know if he's there, so I don't really want to pray to the oxygen in the room. Uh, to whom shall I pray uh, if he's not there? It was, it's a conundrum, you see. But sometimes you're in enough pain, and I was, uh, to do silly things. And I did pray, and I, and I said in my anguish, and it was very real anguish, I said, God, if you are there, please reveal yourself to me. Punch a hole through the sheetrock, wave to me, say hello, show yourself to me. I was desperate. Every now and again, I would pray that prayer. I'd be jogging. I'd pray that prayer. God, help me. I need help. Um, it was an honest prayer, and prayers come from a place of honesty, not religiosity. If you can say, help me, Lord, God hears that prayer. Then one night, around my 25th birthday during this time, I had a dream. We don't have time to go into it this morning, but it was an amazing dream. Uh, I'm not making this up. If you want to hear uh, the story of this amazing dream, you can go to my website, which is just my name. If you can spell it, it's ericmetaxas.com. If you can't spell it, it's still ericmetaxas.com. And... Um, because it's an amazing thing and it changed my life. God came into my life, Jesus um, came into my life, and uh, it's all true except for the part about the UFO and the Sasquatch, which I, I made up. Um, but seriously, watch that, uh, if you don't mind, because it really happened, it's not made up. Um, and when God came into my life overnight and answered that prayer, I, I wondered, why hadn't I heard this before? Why did I have to suffer not knowing? Why, why? And I think part of the reason is that I had rejected a phony religious idea of God. Not God as he really is. Because when I encountered God as he really is, I knew that is what my heart is longing for. That is the answer. He is the answer to my pain and all my questions. He's real. And he loves me despite everything I've done. He's not some moral code. He's not some energy force. He's alive. He's a person. He knows everything about me. And about you, he knows my story, he knows your story, every detail, he knows your deepest fears, he knows the terrible selfish things you have done that have hurt others. And he still loves you. And he knows the hurt that others have caused you. He, he knows us. He's alive. He's not a joy-killing bummer or some moralistic church lady. He is the most wonderful person, capital P, imaginable. In fact, his name is... Wonderful. Now, who would reject that? So at that point, I realized everything I had rejected about God was actually not God. It was just dead religion. It was phoniness. It was people who go to church and do not show the love of Jesus. It was people who know the Bible and use it as a weapon. People who don't practice what they preach. People who are indifferent to the poor and suffering. People who use religion as a way to exclude others from their group. People who use religion as a way to judge others. I had rejected that, but guess what? Jesus had also rejected that. He had railed against that and called people to real life and real faith. Jesus was and is the enemy of dead religion. Jesus came... That's true. That is true. That's not a point of view. That is true. He came to deliver us from 
that. He railed against the religious leaders of his day because he knew that it was all just a front, that in their hearts they were far from God his Father. When he was tempted in the desert, who was the one throwing Bible verses at him? Satan. That is a perfect picture of dead religion, using the words of God to do the opposite of what God does. It's grotesque when you think about it. It's demonic. That summer as I came to faith, uh, the guy who shared his faith with me, Ed Tuttle, gave me a copy of The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he asked me if I'd ever heard of Bonhoeffer, and I said no. And he said, oh, well, Bonhoeffer was a pastor who, because of his faith in Jesus, stood up for the Jews of Europe. I was shocked. I was shocked. My mother is German. She grew up during this period. Why had I never heard this amazing story about Bonhoeffer before? I remember thinking, somebody really ought to write a book about Bonhoeffer. I was not interested in writing biographies. I'm far too self-centered to spend that much time focusing on someone besides myself. Uh, I went on to have a strange career, children's books. I wrote humor for the New York Times. Uh, I worked for Veggie Tales. Yes, Veggie Tales, thank you. Oh yeah, I knew. Oh yeah, yeah, now you're listening. And then I wanted to share my faith and I wrote a book with the ridiculous title, Everything You Always Want to Know About God But We're Afraid to Ask. Um, Actually, it's now a trilogy, three books. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a trilogy. Am I getting that right? Yeah. And uh, one day I found myself being interviewed on CNN about this book, and I was expecting one of those tough, you know, questions like, how can a good God allow evil and suffering? But instead I got a softball question. The, the, the host on CNN said to me, you know, there's something in here about Wilberforce. And I had like two sentences in the book about Wilberforce. Uh, can, can you talk about that? And uh, suddenly I'm on CNN being asked to talk about Wilberforce. Um, all I knew about Wilberforce was in the book, was that he was someone who took the Bible so seriously that he changed the world forever. So I start talking about him briefly, and next thing I know, a publisher calls me up and says, oh yeah, there's a movie coming out called Amazing Grace. Um, now I'm sure you know the song Amazing Grace. Yeah, we'll, we'll sing it later. But um, I, I, I didn't write the song, I just want to be clear, it was written by, it was written by the fabulous Mr. Tony Bennett. Is he here? No. Um, but seriously, I was asked to write a book about Wilberforce. Amazingly, I wrote a biography about Wilberforce, and everywhere I'd go talking about Wilberforce, people would say to me, who are you going to write about next? Who are you going to write about next? Some people asked me, about whom will you next write? <laughs> As a Yale English major, I want to recommend the word whom. Uh, if, if English is your first language, and some of you in here, it's your first language, you may want to use the word whom. It's, you can get it free as an app on your iPhone. You just download it. You use it as much as you want. Um, Eric, about whom will you next write? And I thought, well, there is only one person besides Wilberforce, only one about whom I would write if I were to write a second biography. I remembered Bonhoeffer. And of course, I did write that book. And I have to tell you, nobody's more shocked by the reception of the book than I. No one is more grateful to the Lord uh, for the people who are reading and talking about this book. I know that it was read uh, even uh, by President George W. Bush, who's intellectually incurious, as we've all read. He read the book. N no pressure. I just, I just want to say no pressure. No. I know, I know. I know you're very busy, Mr. President, but I know sometimes you're, you take plane rides and you've got time to kill, so here. I, I gotta, I gotta. Just think, no pressure. No pressure at all. No pressure at all. Who am I to pressure you? Um, nonetheless, the lives of both of these men illustrate the difference between phony religiosity and really believing in God in a way that is real, that changes your life, that must change your life, and the lives of others. Now, Wilberforce, of course, is best known for leading the movement to end the slave trade. Now, why did he take that on? Do you know why? I'm here to tell you it's not because he was just a churchgoer, because there were plenty of churchgoers in England in the day of Wilberforce, and everybody in that day seemed to have no problem with the slave trade or slavery, people who went to church. The reason Wilberforce fought so hard was because around his 26th birthday, he encountered Jesus, really. England paid lip service to religion in those days. Everybody said, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm English. Yeah, we're, we're Christians. Uh, 
but they really seem to think, most of them, that the slave trade was a fine thing. So keep in mind that when someone says, I am a Christian, it might mean absolutely nothing. But for Wilberforce, it became real. It was not about Christianity. It was about the living God and serving him. And Wilberforce suddenly took the Bible seriously, that all of us are created in the image of God. He took this idea seriously, that it was our duty to care for the least of these. And he said, Lord, I will obey. Now, he fought politically. He fought hard. And you know, the only people really fighting with him at this point were the fanatical Christians. Did you know that? All the churchgoers, all the religious people, they were not alongside him. Who was alongside him in those days? The born-again nuts, the Quakers, the Methodists that people made fun of, they were in the trenches because they knew they had no choice but to regard the Africans as made in the image of God and worthy of our love and respect. Everyone else was just going with the flow. All the people who just went to church, as I say, they got it wrong. They had not seen Jesus. Wilberforce took these ideas, these foreign ideas from the Bible and brought them into culture. And you can read about it, not just in my book, which the president may read, uh, but you can read about it. This is historical fact. This is not my spin. This is true. Wilberforce, because he believed what the Bible said and because he obeyed what God told him to do, he changed the world. Today, think of this, my friends. Today, we argue about how to help the poor. Some say, oh, the public sector, government is the answer. Others say the private sector, free enterprise. But today, we argue about how to help the poor, not whether to help the poor. Praise the Lord. The idea to care for the poor, the idea that slavery is wrong, these ideas are not normal human ideas. These are biblical ideas imported by Wilberforce at a crucial time. Human beings do not do the right thing apart from God's intervention. We always do the phony religious thing, we go with the flow. In Wilberforce's day, going with the flow meant supporting slavery, that Africans are not fully human. In Bonhoeffer's world, in Nazi Germany, it meant supporting the idea that Jews are not fully human. So whom do we say is not fully human today? Who is expendable to us? Please discuss amongst yourselves. Thank you. <laughs> but back to Nazi Germany. Folks, this was a moment ago. My mother lived through this. There are people in this room who lived through this. This is a moment ago. I was in Germany last week. I met people who lived through this period. It was an extraordinary thing to be there, to meet people who, who were the sons of heroes fighting against Hitler. This was a moment ago that this horror happened. Now, if you don't know who Bonhoeffer is, let me say very briefly, Bonhoeffer was born uh, in 1906. Uh, actually on February 4th, that's two days from now, and it's two days after my wife's birthday. <laughs> now she begged me not to mention that her birthday was today, but, but honey, would you, would you please stand up, please? <laughs> Sweetie, don't be shy, come on, please. She's, see how shy, she's so shy, she hates the public eye. I'm sorry. You sure you don't want to stand? Sweetie pie, come up for me on your birthday. All right. Back to Bonhoeffer. All right, I tried. Um, Bonhoeffer was born into an amazing family. His father was the most famous psychiatrist in Germany. This was a big, important, amazing family. At 14, he announces he wants to be a theologian. He got his doctorate at age 21. Anybody here get their doctorate at 21? Uh, I'm waiting. No? Me either. Uh, although I just began work a week ago, uh, just started work on my honorary doctorate. Thank you. Um, <laughs> ridiculous. Bonhoeffer was a great theologian, but he decided in the midst of being a great theologian that he wanted to get ordained as a Lutheran pastor. And then one day at age 24, he went to America to spend a year in New York City, where I live with my wife and daughter. and. He went to study at Union Theological Seminary. But one Sunday, a fellow student named Frank Fisher, an African-American from Alabama, invited Dietrich Bonhoeffer 
to Harlem to a church called Abyssinian Baptist Church. He says, why don't you come with me? And Bonhoeffer went with him. And for the first time in his life, in that church, he saw something that was clearly not mere phony religion. He saw people worshiping a living God. He saw people who understood suffering and whose worship was real. Bonhoeffer said that in New York, in America, he did not hear the gospel proclaimed. Think of this. He visited many, many churches. He did not hear the gospel proclaimed, except in his words, in the Negro churches. That was the only place he saw the true gospel. He saw true faith, living faith, people living it, preaching the gospel of Jesus, living the gospel of Jesus. He saw this among the suffering in Harlem, and it changed his life. When he got back to Germany, people could see that he was different. He wasn't intellectually different, but his heart had been changed. He began to speak publicly about the Bible as the Word of God, the living Word of God through which God, who is alive, wishes to speak to us. So he understood from the black church in Harlem the idea of a personal faith, that God is alive and wishes to speak to you. Of course, it had a political uh, uh, component because now it's 1932, the Nazis are rising. Bonhoeffer begins to say things that you would not hear in Germany, even in the churches in those days. He spoke of Jesus as the man for others. He said, whoever does not stand up for the Jews has no right to sing Gregorian chants. God is not fooled. His whole life was about this idea that you have to have a living relationship with God and that it must lead you to action, that you must obey God, that you will look different. Now, of course, dead religion demonizes others. I just said that. And apart from God's intervention, that is what we do. So don't think that you won't do that. You will do that. We are broken, fallen human beings. Apart from God, that's what we do. We don't think that we're better than the Germans. You think you're better than the Germans in that era? You're not. Not in God's eyes, you're not. We're the same. We're capable of the same horrible things. Wilberforce somehow saw what the people in his day didn't see, and we celebrate him for it. Bonhoeffer saw what others did not see, and we celebrate him for it. Now, how did they see what they saw? There's just one word that will answer that. It's Jesus. He opens our ideas, our eyes, to his ideas, which are different from our own, which are radical, now, personally, I would say the same thing about the unborn, that apart from God, apart from God, we cannot see that they are persons as well. So those of us who know the unborn to be human beings are to love those who do not yet see that. We need to know, we need to know that apart from God, we would be on the other side of that divide fighting for what we believe is right. We cannot demonize our enemies. Today, if you believe abortion is wrong, you must treat those on the other side with the love of Jesus. Today, if you have a biblical view of sexuality, you will be demonized by those on the other side who will call you a bigot. Jesus commands us to love those who call us bigots, to show them the love of Jesus. If you want people to treat you with dignity, treat them with dignity. Jesus tells us, that we must love our enemies. That, my friends, is the real difference between dead religion and a living faith in the God of the scriptures, whether we can love our enemies. Wilberforce had political enemies, but he knew that God had commanded him to treat them with civility. He knew that he had been saved by grace. He was not morally superior to the people on the other side of the aisle. Martin Luther King told the people on the buses that you must not fight back. You must be willing to turn the other cheek or get off the bus. Branch Rickey told Jackie Robinson, if you want to win the battle, you need to do as Jesus commanded and be strong enough to not fight back. Enemies will know that there is someone, capital S, standing behind you, that it's not just you. So if you can see Jesus in your enemy, in your enemy, then you can know that you are seeing with God's eyes and not your own. So can you love your enemy? If you cannot pray for those on the other side, if you cannot actually feel the love of God for your enemies, political and otherwise, 
My friends, that's a sure sign that you are being merely religious, that you have bought into a moral system, but you do not know the God who has forgiven you. Only God can give us that supernatural agape love for those with whom we disagree. That's the test. It is an impossible standard apart from the grace of God. We all fail that test, but thank God for the grace of God. The grace of God is real. God wants to shed it abroad in every heart, not just on some, on every heart. It is the only thing, the grace of the living God, that can bring left and right together to do the right thing. So can we humble ourselves enough to actually ask him in a real prayer to show himself to us, to lead us to do what is right? Can we do that for our country, for the world? This is a Bonhoeffer moment. If we will humble ask God, cry out, cry to cur, cry from the heart, Lord, lead us. Will you ask him to help you? The amazing grace of God, the amazing grace of God is there for everyone. You know, Jesus is not just for so-called Christians. Jesus is for everyone. For everyone. And the grace of God is for everyone. I hope you know that. When I was uh, 21 years old, uh, I worked at the Boston Opera House, and Garrison Keillor showed up, and he gave a talk. And at the end of his talk, um, he asked the audience if the audience wanted to sing. They, they didn't. <laughs> but he made them anyway. Uh, he led them in a, a song called Amazing Grace. And that a cappella rendition has stuck with me my whole life, and I thought, maybe someday I'll get some people to do that. Not today, of course. But then I thought, you know, if, if, if the president can sing Al Green... <laughs> then maybe you can sing with him. So we're going to try this. If it goes well, I'll leave with my head up. You ready? If you don't know the lyrics, pretend that you do. I want to hear harmonies. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but God bless you.